Peace. Welcome to Beyond Breaking Barriers. I'm your host, Piper Carter, um, here on Black Power Media. Uh, as you're coming in, I want to ask you to go ahead and like, share, and subscribe. Click that bell. Go into the description where you'll see all of our links to our social media so you can share it with your social links. And also, to uh, we're asking folks that if you like this program or anything you see on this channel, that you go to the Black Power Media, Media Patreon and um, become a member of the Patreon there. So as folks come in, uh, I want to welcome you. Again, the show is Beyond Breaking Barriers, where we talk about and center issues relating to women in hip hop. And today I have a wonderful guest. I'm very excited. Um, I'm going to I'm going to uh, allow this guest to like talk about their self because they have a very extensive bio and um, so that I don't misname or misnomer <laughs> because for me, um, this person is, I would say a change maker and an educator. And I wonder if they would say the same, but um, so um, Dr. Dia works with uh, youth and communities and uh, bridges and blends um, I'll say the political sphere with, uh, what we call like hip hop pedagogy, if you will. And so that's very basic and very, you know, streamed down. I do want to say that I've been in contact with her for years and, um, I, I'm very excited that today, um, we have a chance to feature her on Beyond Breaking Barriers because we get a chance to, um, get up to date on all the amazing work that she's been doing, but also get to learn some history about the powerful work that she's been doing over the years. And so I would like us to welcome Dr. Dia. Hey, hey, hey. Thank peace. you, Piper. Peace, peace. Yeah, thank you so much. So um, I really appreciate you. I've been a fan of yours for a while, for a long, for some years. I've been following your work and, um, and it's been inspired by your work and, mm -hmm. um, just been utilizing some of your ideas and tactics within the work that I do working with youth. And so, um, yeah, like for, first of all, um, tell us who you are, where you are and what you do. Awesome. Well, thank you for those kind words. I have been a fan of yours as well and definitely inspired by everything that you have been doing with hip hop. Um, I'm Dr. Dia Winfrey, better known as Dr. Dia, and I currently live in Talladega, Alabama. This is where my family has been for seven generations now, and um, I count it an honor to carry on the work and the legacy that was started by my great grandparents, my great great grandparents um, here in this community. Um, my work, my life's work has always involved hip hop culture. Even it started in childhood. I'm you know, a child of the 80s, a teen of the 90s and really grew with hip hop. I was born in Louisville, Kentucky and raised in Jeffersonville, Indiana. So, you know, we were kind of like, almost Midwest, but Southern. So my experience with rap and then just, you know, growing up in the golden era and, and just where we had diversity in music, I really saw how hip hop was a powerful tool for storytelling as well as activism. And so, um, like I said, as a child, I just was always inspired by rap. Tupac was my favorite artist, still my favorite rapper to this day. And um, and and just growing up in that way inspired me to look at hip hop as more than just entertainment. Uh, I am a doctor of psychology, so I'm a doctor for real, not like Dr. Dre. And um, <laughs> when I uh, entered my doctoral program, I knew that I wanted to do something that highlighted hip hop. I didn't know what that was going to be. But uh, as I matriculated through the program and saw that there was a real need for hip hop to be used, particularly with black boys um, in, in the field of psychology, I decided to 
do something groundbreaking at that time, which was highlighting the positive qualities of hip hop culture as part of my doctoral dissertation. And so I created the hype healing young people through empowerment, hip hop therapy curriculum as my dissertation. Um, I started working on it in 03 and defended it in 07. So if you think back to how hip hop was looked at at that time, it was still very much um, not mainstream. It was not hip hop was not what it is now where we're seeing hip hop 50 everywhere and every kind of dignitary celebrating hip hop in the early 2000s. There was still that negative connotation. And so um, I was met with a lot of resistance when I was working on my dissertation, but the final product, the work spoke for itself. So um, when I went on my pre-doctoral internship and piloted the program, again, I was met with resistance. Um, it was at a, a, a corrections facility, a juvenile corrections facility in Wisconsin, but the impact was felt immediately. And so that really kicked off my work with hip hop uh, hip hop therapy and hip hop empowerment. So from there, that's where my work segued into what I do with politics once I moved here to Alabama in, um, in 2015. So, uh, when it comes to me and hip hop, yes, you know, I love rap. I love going to concerts and the party scene, but, um, also when I'm talking hip hop, I'm talking hip hop culture, shout out to, to minister server and, uh, the mentorship I've gotten from him over the years in, in that regard. So first, thank you for that. First, I want to say peace um, to Kalanji, if you're still here. Kalanji was in the chat, said so that's my sister. And I uh, wanted to shout out uh, Zenzibel. Um, and also wanted to shout out uh, Jamon. Yep, says welcome. And wanted to say thanks so much for to Anxious Man for the super chat. So uh yeah, and shouts out to you, Warren, as well. So yeah, just want to uh, say peace to some people peace. Uh, as 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 they join us. Oh, there goes Yipper, saying peace to all of us. So Yipper is cool. Um, so this is so interesting because you were saying that your, um, I guess what was it like your highlight years? <laughs> Would you say is like your high school? I don't know. For me. That's how I um, would look at some of my hip hop, like where I was really like, ah, and, but I feel like I grew with it through my college years. So it seems like I'm older than you. So your high school was like, I was out of college, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I'm wondering, like you were, and then you were speaking about how, um, cause I remember, um, the kind of phases where for me, hip hop was like kind of party, have fun. And then it became like, you know, I'm gonna say like mission driven, like this sort of like, you know, developing your identity as like a cultural nationalist, I guess. Uh -huh. And then, um, then for me, it went into more like squarely, just like, you know, a hip hop culture, you know, and then I guess, uh, for me, that's where I saw like the commercial infiltration and the, and the, what I'll call the decline. But, um, um, I'm wondering when you speak about, you know, your, as a young person, like what impact or how did hip hop shape you or did mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, it definitely did. So my story to hip hop, my journey through hip hop, um, I was born in 79. So pretty much, you know, the first rap song on the radio, like I, my whole life, there, there's always been rap music in that way. Um, but in 92, when I was 12, uh, Tupac's song, Brenda's Got a Baby came out. And at that time, my 12 year old classmate was pregnant. And for those that, that don't know, Brenda's Got a Baby is a song about a 12 year old girl having a baby. And so while my parents did not like rap music, like most parents of that time did not like rap, uh, my mom did recognize the fact that, okay, there's a song on the radio telling the story about this girl. And, you know, she could find some commonalities with my experience with my classmate. Now, being 12, I didn't understand. I mean, I knew that that was not a common thing, but I didn't really conceive what that meant. But 
having that uh having that that song as a way for me and my mom to have that conversation that was really where the seed was planted for me as it relates to height now uh with me being a fan of tupac you know as we know uh, that was tupac's first solo album and because that song has such resonance with me at the age of 12 um from seventh grade up to my senior year in high school when tupac was uh murdered he was just really central to my development as uh, as an organizer. Uh, I was already involved with the NAACP and already active in my community as it relates to just, you know, understanding electoral politics. But, you know, Pac brought in the uh, that black power element not I, and, and it gave me a, a another um, I guess another way of confirmation that this was part of my past because if you think back to the 90s piper i know that you know that the grown folks was telling us that the the fight was over like what are y'all you know what are y'all complaining about y'all don't have nothing to complain about that stuff that's you know that all that's already happened y'all got it made but what rap did and what hip-hop did in the uh in the late 80s and early 90s is it justified what we were seeing in the community so um, I was blessed to attend the church that I did because my pastor was a revolutionary pastor. He was an activist in the community. So he would he would have conversations with me about Tupac and allow me to share the lyrics with him. And he actually gave me a platform from the pulpit at church on Sunday mornings to talk to the adults to help them understand the power of hip hop and, and the messages that Tupac had and um, his connection to the Black Panther Party. So that was me in middle and high school and so when pop was killed my senior year um that really that really shook me up and really was um again just kind of another one of those seeds that was planted that that helped me realize this was more than just entertainment for me now when i went to college um i kind of fell back from the work i was doing i was i was very very active in in my community as a high school student and and even um, received the honor of being an Olympic torchbearer at the age of 16 for the activism and the work I had done. So when I went to college, I'm like, I want to just be regular. I don't want to do all that stuff. And so I pretty much chill. But uh, when I went into my doctoral program, it's like all of that got got kicked back up in me. And, and I just really um, got focused on, um, on finding ways to push hip hop into this space, uh, the, the field of psychology, a space that's very much uh, whitewashed and uh, and push, push the culture into this field. Because you got to understand, like the dissertations before mine, if they spoke about rap at all, it was like, this is what happens when you consume rap. These are the negative things that happen. Like that's every single dissertation until mine. And so um, I really wanted to find a way to uh, use the opportunity of being a doctoral student to not just get a grade and get a degree, but to really shift the field, but also shift the culture of hip hop. Mm -hmm. And so I'm gonna say peace to Leah Boggs for coming in here. So you talked a little bit about, you know, your connection to hip hop. I wanna switch just a little bit because I wanna start blending these two worlds. So, um, Tell us about your journey for running as the first black woman nominee in Alabama's third congressional district uh, to like founding Transform Alabama, right? Which is mm -hmm. a, your nonprofit that's focused on uh, voter education and engagement. Yes, yes. So um, getting into politics, when I uh, moved back to Alabama in 2014, um, I kept the work up that I was doing with hip hop as a tool for empowerment. We did a block party out here and, and just really were engaged in the community. So in 2017, there was a special election here for the U.S. Senate, which um, Doug Jones ended up winning that election. And so um, during his campaign, the, uh, the Democratic Party chair in my county reached out um, to me because he had known about the, the work I had done and he asked would I be interested in volunteering with Doug Jones. So I'm just like, sure, you know, and, and so we were out there and uh, the work that we did actually helped Doug Jones win my county. And if you look at the map of Alabama um, with Doug Jones's win, 
all of the states or all the counties around us uh, went Republican and we're like the only little blue sliver there. And so that put me on a lot of people's radar. And, and that was right at the point where the qualifying was starting for um, the 2018 election cycle. And um, people were like excited about me as a as a person you know i was a mom um i have four children and at the time my babies were still kind of small so people just you know like the vibe i was bringing and and um like my background and and uh got behind me and i put my name in the race um in 2018 i actually had a democratic opponent and uh but it was it was a great way to get into politics because i saw the ugly of it up front and um I was told in the beginning to hide the hip hop, you know, the, the, my, uh, you know, people mean well, but uh, my opponent was a former Miss America white lady. And, you know, I'm a black woman, um, single mom. And everybody's like, the last thing we need is for them to know about the hip hop stuff. Like just keep it at Dr. Winfrey. You are not Dr. Dia. And so, you know, I'm like, okay, I'll follow the advice. Cause it seems sound. I get it. Um, but within the first few weeks, I quickly realized that um, if I'm going to do this, I need to do it my way. Um, people are either going to rock with me or not. And uh, and it became clear and evident that, I mean, even though I know racism is real and people have stereotypes, but to see other Black people in leadership uh, coming at me real sideways and, and telling me, you know, I'm not going to win because I'm Black and they're not going to support me because I am Black. Um, was all I needed to hear to just say, you know what, I'm going to be me and we're going to, you know, bring hip hop in the way that we do. And so um, I ended up having a campaign DJ, shout out to DJ Oscar Austin um, out of Tuskegee. And we ran a great race. I didn't win in 2018, but I garnered over 11,000 votes, which showed that most of the white people in the district voted for me, despite whatever stereotypes people said would keep me from um, being successful, the reason I actually didn't win that primary is because the black leadership endorsed the white candidate. And so a lot of the black people just kind of followed suit. They didn't realize it was a black person on the ballot. But uh, what that opportunity did for me, um, because I did run such a good race, it allowed me to work with more experienced politicians on uh, the, gov the uh, gubernatorial campaign and just really sharpen my skills and learn more about electoral politics. So when 2020 came around, I was not going to run. I, I didn't want to run again. I really had visions of Transform Alabama then, but I'm so thankful that I ended up running because um, the qualifying period was in 2019. And we all know, you know, what the world was looking like in 2020. And so um, during my campaign, what me and my team decided to do was rather than make my campaign all about me and my platform, we would use it as a real time political education campaign. Um, in Alabama, we have overall, we have really good voter registration. Like we have a lot of registered voters, but the turnout is is just completely dismal when it comes to people who are registered going out to vote because people truly feel like their vote does not matter. And so uh, we use 2020 as an opportunity to show people in real time with the things that we were seeing on social media and on TV, how elections affect our everyday life. And so um, we went around the 13 counties and, and uh, spread this different message using hip hop, uh, DJ Oscar was was still my my campaign DJ, and we would just do like outdoor events, kickball games, fish fish fries, um, block parties, all kind of stuff to just bring people out and share this information. And so, uh, in the end, um, I garnered over a hundred and four thousand votes, which was the second highest vote count of any Democrat to run in my district, um, only second to the person that was on the ballot when Obama ran in 08. And with that being said, with my numbers being that high, um, the black turnout was particularly low that year. And so it just shows that uh, what it showed us is that, um, you know, if we could really keep pushing this message of voter education and helping people understand um, the power of our vote, we may actually be able to change some things. And so after um, at my election party, at my watch night party, my team would just like, let's just keep talking about how we can we can keep this political education message going and how we can continue to go into the community. And so 
we've been doing it ever since then. So thanks for that. I'm going to say peace to breaking ground. Minister Server said, uh, let me put Minister Server up here for a second. So uh, Minister Server says, uh, peace and love to our sisters and looking forward to the conversation. So thanks for joining us. And also to peace to Big Teal. So I uh, just wanted to say peace to the folks that came in. So I'm wondering, I have a lot of questions here. But this is what I want to do first, because I have this kind of what I'll call like controversial questions. Yeah. Let's I'm going to switch like the order of the questions and okay. I'm going to bring those some of those up um, to the top so that we could maybe talk about that and then go back into like more of your work. Is that OK? Yeah, actually, that's perfect. Yeah. OK. So what I had sent here to you, I was you know, just naming these different uh, perceptions, right? So we were mm -hmm. saying that um, there's, I'm going to say like, or a perception of effectiveness, right? So from the leftist perspective, there's arguments for and also against the authenticity and the inclusivity and, and long-term impact of the approach to using hip hop culture as a tool for political uh, and voter engagement, suggesting that it might not be the most efficient way to reach and educate voters, right? So um, we're saying there's a positive effectiveness perceptions, there's a mixed effectiveness perceptions, and there's like a negative effectiveness perceptions. So um, if we'll say I'll out myself <laughs> and say I'm more <laughs> on the positive effectiveness <laughs> perceptions. Uh, so basically, you know, engaging young voters, uh, so like supporters, you know, like myself will view this approach as highly effective in engaging and mobilizing young black voters who might otherwise be disinterested in politics. Um, so like innovative outreach. So many see this strategy as innovative and creative, breaking away from traditional political methods to reach new audiences um, effectively and increase voter turnout. So some may believe that these efforts may have the potential to increase voter turnout, especially among demographics with historically low perception rates. Mm -hmm. So the, let's say the mixed effectiveness perception. So um, might say there's that it's exclusive, exclusive to like youth culture. So some may believe that while this approach is effective with younger voters, it might not resonate well with older demographics who have different, uh, preferences for political communication, uh, creating a generational divide. So um, I'll just ask a question there before moving on. So have you experienced um, generational divides or like criticism or any of these criticisms? So I would say yes. Well, in, in 2018, I definitely did um, my first congressional run, but um, as it relates to what we're doing now with the nonprofit, um, I really, we, we really have gotten good responses and I kind of think it's just timing with hip hop 50 this year. Um, it has really shown just the, the growth of hip hop as it relates to, you know, number of years that we've been around. And so, you know, shout out to Server, the dopest hip hop grandpa. When we talk in hip hop, we are talking about multiple generations. We're talking about people um, over 60. We're talking about people, you know, under 18. We're, we're talking about the whole gamut. And what we ended up finding now initially um, as a candidate, uh, my use of hip hop was just me being authentic to myself. I wasn't really necessarily thinking about um, turnout other than I want black people to turn out. Like I just, you know, that general thinking. But now as a co-founder of this 501c3 and uh, having more access to data and information, we've been able to look more closely at the turnout and who is actually going to vote and who is not. And the thing that has surprised us is that young people are voting, but the, that age that's really not voting is that 40 to 55 age group, that Gen X age group that is hip hop culture. And so now, and this is information that we've just learned um, within the last several months. 
And uh, for me and the other people on the team, that has given us encouragement for how we move forward with our message. Like if we know that is that age group that is the lowest turnout, well, this is perfect for them. You know what I'm saying? Because we could tap into that golden era where the music was already, that was already the messaging in the music. Or we could give people, you know, I mean, there, there's a lot of us that are artists uh, within that age group, and, and we can allow people platforms to put different messages out using hip hop and, and to just garner uh, more of, of the attention that we need for a uh, server, for, uh, for that voter engagement to go up. But the other thing uh, that we push with Transform Alabama is that it's not just about election day. And that's really where we miss out as a community we we wait until election day or election season to fall in line and get behind whatever candidate versus working within the community 365 days a year like doing year-round organizing um getting behind legislation getting behind uh, certain things that are going on civically that can help us build political power in our communities. And that's really another piece of where we see hip hop being a great tool in doing that work. Mm -hmm. And um, so with that, um, under the mixed effectiveness perception, so there's what what, what is called a sustainable impact and limited policy focus. So some may assert that the strategy is more focused on the short-term mobilization rather than addressing systemic issues. And there might be questions about the long-term sustainability of using hip hop culture and politics and whether it can lead to lasting change. And they might argue that the emphasis on voter registration and engagement should be complemented with um, broader policy advocacy. So, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so what's your strategy for the long-term impact? And I will agree, agree with that wholeheartedly. I would, I would agree with, um, with, with that argument. And so, uh, that is, that is why we take the approach of, uh, year-round organizing, year-round civic engagement activity. So we start from the premise of helping people understand just, um, what our political system is. A lot of people don't understand the branches of government and who does what, or even just on like a municipal level, on a local level, what offices are responsible for what things. So uh, we'll have like, um, or we'll partner with people that are having car shows or block parties and we'll show up and we'll have information that we're handing out to people or just having conversations with people at the event, you know, like, you know, when, when's the last time, you know, you, you wouldn't voted or how do you feel about, you know, your city councilman or just, you know what I'm saying? Cause just conversations to get people talking and thinking. And even those people that may not vote, they still have an opinion about those people elected in office. And, and that's really kind of how it starts. The other piece of the work that we do, because we do a year round organizing um, is, and, and all this is new again, you know, we just formed in, in 2020 and uh, we just became a 501c3 last year. But it, in 2023, our focus has really been on using traditional things like phone banking and door knocking to, uh, to get not only like the people that we contact involved, but getting our volunteers involved in civic engagement. So uh, I'm always like looking for grant opportunities or partnership opportunities that would allow us to be able to pay people to phone bank and pay people to knock on doors. Because what we've been finding um, this year in 2023, it allows us to attract people who are looking for ways to make some extra cash, like college students or just people you know, who may be on disability or different things like that, where they, you know, could make a little change to supp supplement their income, but they may not even be registered to vote. But by them making so many phone calls about voting or Medicaid expansion or them um, knocking on so many doors, it starts impacting their own thinking about their civic engagement. And so um, that is actually part of our strategy of getting people involved um, long term. It's not always the people that, you know, that, that may typically get involved in civic engagement that we're looking for. We're looking for those people 
that really have not been tapped. And so um, by them knocking on doors and them starting to ask questions and saying, well, why am I not registered to vote? And then they get registered to vote and vote for the first time. Their testimony brings more people into the fold and, and you know, allows us to, to continue to expand. So that's really been the center of our work in 2023 is, mm -hmm. um, is with that. And then the other thing in 2023 is um, with the Supreme Court case, um, Allen versus Milligan, which uh, granted the state of Alabama our second black congressional district, um, that was a major milestone case. And so um, throughout the whole like litigation process from 2021 up until 2023, we've been um, going into the community, talking to people about what redistricting is, why it matters, how all of this ties into the census and really like getting ahead of uh, what we'll have to look forward to in 2020 or 2030, the 2030 census. So, um, you know, really, really doing this work. Yeah. I want to shout out um, Quaker Anarchist too uh, in the building. So it's a nice, uh, and also uh, you don't like my music. <laughs> okay. So, you know, um, when I thought of, like, you know, this spectrum, I, you know, I told you, but I'll just, excuse me, tell folks listening. For me, when I think of uh, debate or arguments or spectrum, I'm not really thinking of people like outside of our people. I'm thinking of how we debate like within our people. So how we bring the left more left or how we all the way on the left just debate our ideas so that we can number one, understand each other. Um, because I think that a lot of times, uh, even if we disagree, it's just important to understand each other and disagreements are fine. So, um, with that, I'll say that this spectrum, uh, is a spectrum that's like within the left, right? Mm -hmm. Like where we not outside of our people. So when I say, uh, like negative effectiveness perception. I'm speaking of our folks, but the folks that maybe disagree, right? With this, with this approach, with this work and all of that. So um, some folks might say that it's like cultural, you know, appropriation. So some might argue that this approach may be seen as cultural appropriation or uh, an insincere or inauthentic attempt to capitalize on hip hop culture for, you know, exploitive political gain. And uh, I guess maybe I'll mix these couple ones all together because they're all kind of similar. So, so they might say a superficial engagement. So some may question whether using hip hop music and culture as a vehicle for political engagement can effectively address complex political issues or if it might over oversimplify them, um, they argue that this approach could encourage a uh, superficial or symbolic engagement with the issues, prioritizing style over substance. And then um, uh, like lack of concrete um, policy proposals. So some might dismiss these efforts as like a mere gimmick or distraction from substantive political discourse, creating the illusion of addressing structural inequities without delving into the root causes accompanied by concrete policy proposals and legislative changes required to target structural inequalities. And um, they might argue that engaging voters and raising awareness are essential steps. But again, you know, they need to be followed by concrete actions to dismantle systemic disparities. And then the last point that some of them say is a uh, like economic and, and social policies, right? So, um, like addressing, uh, structural, you know, inequalities, like often requires a comprehensive economic and, uh, and social policies that go beyond the cultural realm. And so critics might argue that the approach should include a broader policy agenda that tackles issues like income inequality, healthcare access, affordable housing, criminal, you know, uh, eradicate, you know, abolition, all of that. So, um, I have like maybe three, four questions. I'll just put them all together. So one is like, what's your method to ensure that the approach is respectful and genuine? Um, 
how does your program approach like all of this differently? Um, and like, what do you have to say <laughs> to like, you know, any of this, you know, like, what are your thoughts? Have you experienced, you know, it, 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 like given, um, is, is, is any of this your experience or have you, you know, or have you not experienced, you know, any of these pushback or whatever, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, for, the first thing I would say is that argument is not wrong. I mean, you know, anything in the wrong person's hands can be a problem. And the way that we have seen, I mean, just being honest, the way that we have seen our culture, our music weaponized against us, infiltrated and taken over by um, industries and, and, and people with money and power, I mean, yeah, that definitely, I could see that, that being a problem. And, and this is partly why uh, I'm so passionate about us here in Alabama really grabbing hold of hip hop as a tool for political education and making it work for us here. I'll be real selfish about that, y'all. That's why Transform Alabama is in the name because I really, you know, speaking from Alabama's perspective, um, I really see the utility in us being able to address like all of those issues that you named, um, uh, economic inequality, uh, issues with uh, climate injustice. I mean, all of these things that we can name, Alabama is at the center of so many of those issues, but getting that information out and getting the message out to the people that it's affecting the most, especially Black Alabamians, is difficult to do. Now, you know, going back to where I would see the validity in, in that argument and what they're saying, um, as I mentioned, when I ran in 2020, um, I said off tops, like we, we a hundred percent hip hop, like my radio ads are going to be me rapping. Um, I already been had my DJ, you know, y'all know what it is with me. And so, um, minister server was, was actually one of my, um, advisors with my campaign. And he was just like, you know, you the hip hop congressional candidate, like you're doing something that has not been done from inside politics. Like we've already seen how candidates will appropriate hip hop artists. I mean, you know, let's be clear. Obama had Jeezy and Jay-Z and everybody, you know what I'm saying? That's part of how he won, but actually having the candidate be hip hop, that was a first. And so um, the following year, or maybe I think like the following year after I won, um, there was a special election in Ohio for Congress. And the lady that ended up winning, the black woman that ended up winning towards the end, because it was between her and Nina Turner. And uh, towards the end, she actually made a video of her rapping. And uh, my boy DJ O called me like, I told you, like, everybody going to start biting. It's going to end up being real, you know, fake. He was like, that's why we are, we have to really push our message of us being real and us being authentic to the culture. So, I mean, I can't argue against you know, how hip hop can be appropriated because we already see that happening. But what I will say is um, that's not a reason for us to run from it because that's in our in our uh, origins, in our DNA, as it relates to hip hop. When we look at what hip hop stemmed from, we have to look back at the civil rights movement and what those young organizers were doing in the 50s and 60s. Like we're all part of that lineage. And so, it's not really a matter of, you know, is hip hop about political education? I mean, it is. It's just about, are we going to be intentional with uh, what we're doing? The other thing I'll throw in about that is um, when we started, when we when we finally like made the concrete decision that we were going to uh, form Transform Alabama and decided on the name, um, Kalanji was, was part of that inspiration because when I was a candidate, um, he shared with me information about the Lowndes County Freedom Party, which was the original Black Panther Party, which I had never heard anything about. I did not. That, that was a first for me. And so when he shared all these newspaper articles with me and I shared it with DJ O and he had never heard of it either. And he was a um, he got a history degree from Tuskegee University. So when we found out about the Lowndes County Freedom Party, that it was literally a black political party that formed that ran its own slate of candidates 
um, they did all of this stuff in 1966 and they ended up dismantling and joining the Democratic Party in 1970. But when we found out about it, we was like, man, what would have happened if they had a stayed the course and kept this their own political party? And so that was the final like deal breaker where it's like, bro, we got to start this organization. And so we look at what they did with the Lowndes County Freedom Party. A lot of that was hip hop. I mean, we don't, we, I mean, it wasn't hip hop formally as we know it today, but you know, even how they got information and messages out, they made their own comic books to describe to people what the, what the different offices were to help people understand people who had never had the right to vote before, not only getting them to go vote, but to get them to actually run for office. And so they were doing a lot of hip hop type stuff that are hip hop cultural things. And so um, that is really a huge part of our inspiration in the work that we're doing. And a big part of the push of us remaining authentic and us just being intentional on in what we're doing, because we can't stop the, the white supremacists and we can't necessarily stop the corporations from appropriating because that's what they do but if we can make the impact within our communities and get our people locked in and get our people um you know awake to what's going on and the power that we have then our work is done because because they're gonna appropriate our stuff regardless they're already doing it i mean that that's that's what they're already doing so you know let's let's flip it and, and use it our way yeah, and I'm, I was just looking at the chat, and um, they're naming some different folks in the chat. I don't want to uh -oh. rename on this platform just because of uh, different politics. But we'll just say that, yeah, um, you've definitely named uh, your politics are different from the people that they're naming um, in the chat. So, um, yeah, so, okay. Given that your um, initiatives are aimed at like voter empowerment and registration, I can see like some political opponents or parties may view your work as a threat to their interests um, and it could, could like oppose your efforts. Like, have you experienced this? Like, and I'm thinking in the South, but maybe I'm being stereotypical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, to this point, we have, and we are still very new. Um, one thing I will say, because, um, 2023 was our first election cycle of actually being able to um, put some of our um, efforts into practice. We had a municipal election here in Talladega where I live. And so we were able to, um, you know, do our community efforts. And so the uh, the uh, mayor that was elected um, aligned more, I will say, with uh, the issues that uh, the Black Alabamians would support. He um, is actually a Black man as well. And so um, we we felt really good about what we were able to do and the turnout and the impact. And so um, that right there was was something that put us on several people's radars and, and just, um, you know, made people look at us different. Because I think that when, when people in traditional political circles here that we do work with hip hop it's just kind of like oh that's cute that's a novelty you know what i'm saying they really didn't take seriously that that we were uh challenging um how politics is done but uh that election and the fact that the uh that mayor uh mayor hall won by such a wide margin and people recognize what we were doing in the community so again we are our our efforts are uh hip hop based but we use traditional things like phone banking door knocking and we created an election guide and uh really had like information in there about uh voter rights restoration and uh, just really helping people understand again what these elected officials do what what a mayor does in our city by law what uh, city council members do, what the school board does. That's really a big focus of what we do. And also getting our candidates to run that we would like to run. That's another issue that we see here in Alabama. And that's really like one of our biggest challenges with Transform Alabama is, you know, people having good candidates to vote for. 
And ultimately, like our long term goal is getting to a position where we can run our own slate of candidates. But, you know, before we get to that point, we have to have the people mobilized enough to where we can, um, you know, win an election. And that's mm-hmm. kind of like the good thing about Alabama with our turnout being so incredibly low. Like we tell people the biggest voting block in Alabama are the people that stay at home. So if mm-hmm. we can tap into enough of those people, again, our ultimate goal, because I get it. I mean, there's nothing really anybody could tell me about politics and electoral politics as it relates to the the shadiness, the, you know, how so many of these things work against us. And we were our people are pawns. And when I say our people, it's not even just black people, it's all people, especially the rural white people. Like all of us are used as pawns, you know what I mean? But in order for Mm -hmm. us to really change, again, going back to that Lowndes County Freedom Party, you know, we have to be in a position where we are able to run our own slate of candidates, but then have that voting power to get those people into office. And so we're, we're starting at the very base level basic political education. Again, we're not really focused on voter registration at all. We rarely do voter registration because there's so many registered voters already that don't turn out to vote. Our thing is talking to the people who are registered who don't vote because they feel like their vote doesn't count and showing them how you're the biggest voting block. And by you not turning out, the absolute last person that you will want to win is going to win. They're going to, they're happy you're not voting. They don't want you to come out and vote. And and so that that is our message. So um, I kind of have two questions in one, but this one, you know, so one question I have is about the impact of your campaign, the campaign that you ran. Um, but I want to kind of combine that with this question about how does your background in hip hop psychology influence your approach to both your political campaign and the work of uh, Transform Alabama? Mm. So um, I'll start with my campaign. So when I when I ran the the first time, um, I really did not think I was going to run again. Like I said, at that point, I started to see how the poor voter turnout and just the voter apathy was really the problem. And so I wanted to figure out ways that we could get out to the community and, and really start doing political education. But what I noticed, and and it was crazy how it happened, a lot of the people that really did not support my first campaign and really actively worked against me um, started like reaching back out and, um, you know, just sharing different things. Like I didn't realize how many people were watching me and and how I decided I I just made the the decision that I wasn't going to run a dirty race. And I really wanted to make it about the issues of people in Alabama. And a lot of people resonated with that. And so um, when I ran in 2020, again, I didn't realize how many people were watching and and really uh, listening to the message. And so um, while I didn't win, once the election was over, people were contacting me from all over the state, like, don't stop. Like, y'all need to keep pushing that message because the information that you're sharing is really important. And so, um, you know, three years later, I see where other people in the state are using hip hop and using the community approach that we're doing um, in different capacities. And so, um, you know, it makes me feel that you know, none this stuff is not in vain. Now, you know, who's to say, you know, what it's all going to mean, you know, when it's all said and done, because again, the turnout in Alabama is still bad, but um, it, it does, you know, make me feel good that we're bringing communities together. And, and that's really a, a big thing um, in Alabama and part of, of our power or lack thereof, you know, just the, the, um, dismantling of our communities. Um, so I'll say that as far as the, the impact and then, um, the work that I've done with hip hop psychology, that's really been at the heart of everything. Cause as I mentioned before, the whole way I got into electoral politics is because, um, people in the community saw the community work I was doing with hype and they saw how, Um, Like I said, we would do like block parties or I would do um, youth groups through the housing authorities. But when we would bring people together, we would start asking them, like, 
what are things you want to see change in your community? I was um, starting to really work with my city council member at that time and the city manager to start bringing this information that we were finding that the community was given. You know, we weren't going to the formal town hall type meetings because, um, you know, that, that attracts a certain crowd. We wanted to get to the people in the community who are not often the ones that go to um, the city hall meetings or go to the NAACP town halls, but these are people that are, are deeply affected by what's going on in the community. And so all of that started because of my work with Hype. And, and so um, it's, it's definitely all connected and, and uh, members of my team on the Hype movement side and members of my team on the Transform Alabama side always remind me of that. Like, they're like, you are Hype, you are Transform Alabama. Like this is all connected to, um, you know, that seed that was planted in me as, as a kid. And so um, it all kind of flows and, and funnels together. Mm -hmm. So speaking of, yeah, like how it all goes together. So could you share some of your insights um, and some challenges, uh, and, you know, and, you know, and successes, right. Of, uh, engaging young people in, uh, the political process, especially in the rural areas of Alabama. Um, I don't think that we, in my experience, I don't think we highlight enough the, the black folks in rural spaces. Yes. So just, uh, can you speak to that? I'm telling you, Piper, that's it right there. We don't talk enough about black people in rural spaces. Oftentimes when we, when you hear rural Americans, people automatically think of white people, but there are, a, you know, most of the black people in Alabama probably live in rural spaces. And the challenge with that is that it's hard to get information because there's not news channels like there's not tv channels there's not radio stations and in some places there's not newspapers so how do you get that information out um as it relates to young people um we have had some some excuse me some really good successes um one story that i would love to highlight um that recently happened um as i mentioned uh this is the first year that we've really gotten intentional about using um traditional methods of political engagement. Um, shout out to my mentor, Phyllis Hill. Um, I'm uh, on the Selma Jubilee board and uh, we do a hip hop summit. And uh, this year we did it in March and it like all came together. Like we've been planning for the last two years. Like this is the one that it was just, it, it was right there. And so Phyllis was like, okay, great. I'm glad it went good. But what did y'all get from it? Like, what did y'all really do? She was like, you know, y'all let other people come in and collect data, talk to people, but y'all didn't actually do the real type of organizing that you need to really have long-term political power. And so when she challenged me like that, I'm like, y'all, we got to start doing the phone banking and the door knocking. Like we can't just, you know, only focus on the hip hop uh, cultural side. We also kind of had to bring, bring in that more traditional side. And so um, we started that in, uh, in June. And so there's a young man, uh, Maurice, who um, he's a college student and I've known him since he was in, in high school, middle school. And so uh, when the opportunity came up for the phone banking, um, I shared it with him and he's like, yeah, you know, I'll try it out. I'd, I'd like to, you know, do something like that. And he just really like took to it. He really liked, um, of course, you know, making some, some money, but also actually talking to people on the phone about, um, they, were, they were doing a survey about Medicaid expansion and people's access to healthcare here in Alabama. And so um, I would do like Zooms where all of the volunteers and all the workers where we could come together and talk. And so uh, one of the, the prompt questions that we would do is tell me your voting story. And so everybody kind of went around, you know, telling their voting story. So we got to Maurice and he's like, well, to be honest, y'all, he's like, I'm not even registered to vote. He was like, I always thought, cause and he's at the time he was 22. He was like, I just thought, you know, it really didn't matter if I voted. He was like, but we've been doing all this talking about uh, Medicaid expansion and talking to people's legislators. He's like, I feel like I need to get registered to vote. 
And um, and he's like, and then we got a municipal election coming up. So he's like, I'm just going to get reg registered to vote and vote. And so he did. And um, Ashton Hall, who's our mayor now, uh, is our youngest mayor. And him and Maurice actually graduated high school together in 2019. And so for Maurice to have the experience of um, voting for the first time, voting for his classmate who went on to win mayor, um, that really just did something for him. And so while he was already a student ambassador, like he already over um, the summer months was really, you know, just getting more and more engaged. But once he had that experience of going through that whole election cycle, he has gotten that much more motivated to talk to other students on campus and recruit people to come and join Transform Alabama. And so with Maurice's experience, that's what really started to show me, like, you know, if we could use the um the phone banking and the door knocking as a way to bring more people into the fold like this might be a unique way of engaging younger voters and so uh, maurice will always stand out in my mind for a lot of reasons but um for this particular uh breakthrough that we had and, and the election was uh september 22nd so all this is still kind of new but um but he has really i mean I've just seen how empowering that experience was for him and how um, just like a few weeks of phone banking completely shifted his uh, his voter engagement. Mm -hmm. And so um, I want to switch a little bit to maybe like a different type of engagement that y'all do. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us about the role of music videos um, and songs like that. Uh, in your outreach efforts and how do you see them contributing to your mission? And I didn't like uh, prep folks on that. So also tell us about, you know, what BET is and, you know, that all that work. Awesome. Yeah. So um, with, uh, with Transform Alabama, um, so I'm an artist. Um, I've been rapping for the last, again, for the last um, 10 years. I used to rap when I was in uh, middle school and high school and and just kind of went away from it. But I have a wonderful mentor, Tony Blackman, who um, I've worked with uh, since I was actually a doctoral student. And um, in 2011, um, just through my work with Hype and just the, the path I was, was on, um, I started talking to her about what she was doing with Rhyme Like a Girl and just um, tapping more into uh, my creative expression. And so um, I was blessed to join the collective in 2013 and have been writing and, and rapping since then. And so when I uh, when I ran for office uh, in 2018 and 2020, we used music as part of um, our campaign uh, process, our, our, our campaign of getting the word out. And so when it came to Transform Alabama, again, like I said, we we really tapped into the Lowndes County Freedom Party. And the thing that that we learned uh, just with Alabama and 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 the foot soldiers and, and the civil rights movement, the importance of music. And so uh, the moment that we came up with the name Transform Alabama, I said, y'all, we got to have like a song. But I'm like, it has to be something that is done out of intention. And so um, it took me several months to write it. I mean, I, I went into deep meditation, even with finding the beat first and then um coming up with the with the lyrics and so um in 2021 uh we recorded it and we uh we did the video and so it's just like another way of engaging people another way of sparking conversation another way of catching people's ear people who wouldn't necessarily care about rap um dj o he or not not rap but care about politics um dj o mixes it in with his different sets and um, you know, the, the beat is, is definitely like a, a 808 heavy, like turn, turn up beat, you know what I'm saying? And so um, it kind of, you know, gets people engaged without them knowing it. And so um, that that was part of, of the theory with hype and or, I'm not, not hype, but with bet. But um, what it also allowed us to do is to be able to engage with other artists here in Alabama and um and giving me the the opportunity to take the stage with different artists but to get our message and encourage other artists to use their platform to um encourage people to be involved civically 
that might not necessarily be voting. You know what I'm saying? That's not the, the only level of civic engagement, but getting people at least active in their communities. And so that's been part of what our focus was this year, again, um, with coordinating the um, intergenerational hip hop political summit through the Selma Jubilee. We're able to uh, work with different rap artists and um, give them a platform to, to perform, but also give them opportunities to think about how they can use their platform to be change agents in their community. Mm -hmm. And uh, Minister Server said, big up to uh, Tony Blackman. And I bet I've been reaching out to Tony, like, come on the show, mama. But um, yes. she's been busy. I know she came on with Jared before. Um, so hoping she'll make some time to come on here. But um, I'm going to give her lots of love as yes. well. So... I got a few more questions here. Okay. So what, so let's go back. So what inspired you to like, to be like, okay, we're going to merge hip hop. You kind of touched on it, but let's go a little bit deeper. So mm -hmm. what inspired you to like merge hip hop culture with political messaging and, and how did you figure out how to make it, you know, resonate? So the thing was like, I, I keep going back to DJ. Oh man, that's, that's my co-founder with transform Alabama. And, um, and he's always the one, like, we gotta go harder, man. He was like, man, we just gotta make these folk mad. He was like, they're just going to be mad and we just got to do it. And we got to go all out with it. And so, um, he, that has always been him in my ear ever since 2018, when I ran the first time, he's just like, you know, cause he, cause he always say like, you know, I'm a DJ. So he's like, I see what music does. And so he's really been the one encouraging me because it was not easy in the beginning. And now, like I said, now this year, I feel like we kind of in our stride, you know, because it is hip hop 50 and, and people are really being challenged to look at hip hop in a different kind of way. So that's been a great blessing to us. But, um, you know, DJ O always in my ear and, and with me and him, you know, that is my brother out here. And, and we really, um, we really have seen the power of what this music does. I mean, when we did that kickball game, we were out in the country, we were in Chambers County. We were out in the country on this land that these people own and we were just turning up. You know what I'm saying? With just some some good old like down home country folk. But as we was turning up, I'm able to talk to them about, you know, what the attorney general does, what, you know, what, what our secretary of state does, like having these conversations that you would never have, you know, with people really outside of those traditional political spaces. And so, um, you know, it just really is, you know, I, I'm just one that, that definitely believes in uh, divine timing. And, and that really has been part of the story. The other thing um, when it comes to me and O and just our journey together, when Kalanji shared that news article with me, initially, I couldn't take the time to read it because I was a candidate. I was still running for Congress. And so once the campaign was over, and I really read all them articles that he sent me. And I really, it's really started to sink in what the Lowndes County Freedom Party was. And I shared that with DJ O. I was like, bro, I'm like, I feel like it's on us to carry on what they started. And so um, it was like one random Sunday. And O was like, because I just started doing a deep dive, just reading all this stuff, um, just about um, the Lowndes County Freedom Party. And um, and I was like, oh, like, man, I was like, did, did someone just calling me that we need to do this work? He's like, man, forget it. I'm about to get in the car and I'm just about to drive to Lowndes County. So he got in his car, like drove to Lowndes County, like just trying to find these different spaces these historic spaces that we could tap into because i'm like it's like i just feel like we really need to um to get into that energy of what our uh, ancestors did because they laid the foundation you know for whatever reason this history is being buried and not being taught you know let's 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 revitalize it let's use this as our 
you know, the wind at our back to, to get our people free. And so, um, you know, it just, like I said, it was just kind of natural with the hip hop piece, but um, seeing what they did and, and seeing, to me, it was kind of like the natural intersection of hip hop, you know, the more that I started reading. And um, one of my mentors is uh, Miss Annie Pearl Avery, who was a member of SNCC. And so being able to just talk to her about things that Ella Baker told her because she was mentored directly by Ella Baker. So just being able to talk to her about what we were looking to do and talk to her about how we were using hip hop. Um, and Miss Annie Pearl is 80 years old. So, you know, she, she definitely is not, you know, within that, that hip hop generation, but when she was seeing it and she was co-signing what we were doing, um, I, it really, um, it really was an inspiration that we needed. And, and the final thing I'll say is this summer, we uh, Transform Alabama partnered with the um, Alabama State NACP on uh, Hip Hop 50. And, um, and we invited David Banner to, he was one of the artists that performed, but he also came to our panel and uh and 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 uh shared some statements. And so that was Miss Annie Pearl's first experience like that. She actually met David Banner years before in Mississippi, but all of the things that had taken place uh throughout that that panel discussion and then him coming in and then her going to his concert. I'm sure that was her first rap concert and seeing how he was engaging with the crowd and he actually like brought her up on stage and allowed her to tell her story and so uh that night she and i were talking and she's like you know what like she supported what i was doing with hip-hop she got it she you know she was rocking with me and oh but after she saw all of that unfold she was like y'all gotta keep going she was like that that's you know y'all y'all are on to something and so um all of these different nuggets and, and these experiences are are what keep us going because there is a negativity but it's like i'm so tunnel vision with it that that i'm not even you know that i'm i'm blocking it out and unfortunately the negativity often come from the people that would would need to be on our side you know what i'm saying the people the people that you would expect that we would get the negativity from that's often not the people that we do and so that's why we just stay laser focused and and stay on the mission so, so there's a couple of questions in the chat. So mm -hmm. first, I'm going to go here to this question first, which is, you kind of touched on it earlier, but I guess maybe like unfold for us a bit more. What are the specific policies? I think that's more the question, right? Like what are the specific policies that, you know, maybe you've been working on? I think that's what you're asking. Okay, so um, <laughs> as far as specific policies, so we're a five hundred one c three, so we don't um, we don't endorse candidates, we don't endorse legislation, but what we do is bring light to issues that may inspire people to get behind certain legislation. So one thing that has um, that has come up in twenty twenty three is uh climate justice and the impact of um largely corporations using alabama as a dumping ground making billions of dollars off of um, our land our spaces and and making it toxic for us to live we've had a lot of um uh natural disasters so-called natural disasters that have been catastrophic here and so it's affected a lot of the um the areas where black people live and so um talking to people about that like this isn't just a coincidence that this big old tornado came through like that like let's look at how climate change is real you know what i'm saying and just giving black people a space to explore and talk about that and then then you know they can hopefully you know move into the direction of working with groups or um you know getting behind legislation or groups, 501c4s or other uh, political action groups or campaigns that are challenging um, some of the legislation. So, um, but as far as the general issues that, that really come up that um, are good talking points, um, definitely climate justice, um, voting rights, 
uh, restoration, something that frequently comes up is um, is uh, people who are formerly car incarcerating, get incarcerated, getting their voting rights restored. Um, in 2017, uh, Kenny Glasgow sued the state of Alabama and won, giving uh, people who are currently incarcerated the right to vote, depending on what their crime was. And uh, in, in some cases, people um, who they may not be able to vote while they're incarcerated, but getting their rights restored after they've uh, completed their sentence and, and done uh, restitution and all that stuff, getting their rights back. So uh, that is frequently something that comes up. And so we talk to people about that and, um, and uh, more legislation that's coming out here is restricting um, absentee ballots, which again ties into uh, what uh, Pastor Glasgow was able to do with that lawsuit, because in order for somebody who was incarcerated to be able to vote, they vote through absentee. And so um, it's like with anything, you know, when you take two steps forward, the powers that be want to take you three steps back. And so, um, you know, we're seeing that with some of the victories that we won, but uh, but those are some some examples of policies, I guess, that we've gotten behind or or not gotten behind, but just you know give people information on. Um, the final thing is um, the the new congressional map that uh, was adopted last month here in Alabama in 2021, November 2021. Uh, myself and six other plaintiffs filed a lawsuit against the state of Alabama because the map that they had drawn um, violate, violated the Voting Rights Act as well as the constitutional rights of Black Alabamians. And so I ended up coming off of the case because um, I had just run for Congress and um, we were fighting the congressional map. So just, you know, it, 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 I'm glad I did, you know, in, in the end, because uh, the case went to the Supreme Court. And, uh, and we won. And so we have a new map, but getting that information out is, is the work now because the election, uh, the primary is in March and a lot of the areas that are impacted by this new map, the new black majority district is within the black belt of Alabama, within the rural parts of Alabama. And so uh, getting that messaging out to people, letting them know about the case and letting them know how it was won and what this new political power means for them is uh, is what we're doing now, is what we're focused on. Okay. And then to uh, I'm going to go to this next question. It's a little different than what we've been talking about. So um, Zenzibel, uh, and I think if I understand the question correctly, um, in terms of your voter education, do you include uh, things like ca campaign finance, uh, the overabundance of lobbyist money distributed amongst uh, most representatives and how that affects elections? Like, do you cover absolutely. that? Absolutely. I think that's the question. Yes. Yeah, that, yeah okay. I think that's the question. And absolutely, Zinzabel, that is literally why we tell people that their vote matters because our political system as it stands now is really run by corporations and lobbyists it's like whoever has the most money is a person that's gonna win and that was like the shocker to me like when i ran for congress the first time i was like four weeks in before i knew that i was supposed to be out here raising money i didn't know that that's the number one thing that you have to do as a congressional candidate which when you think about that's that's really sickening like why is that the number one thing somebody running for congress or somebody that is currently a congress person the number one thing they got to do is always be raising millions of dollars like why is that and 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 what does that mean for how they govern us but because so many people are disengaged that they're able to do that. And so what we do is we we talk to people about the fact that the biggest voting block are the people that stay at home. And we can have the best candidate on the ballot, you know what I'm saying? Like not to toot my own horn, but when I ran in 2018, I was most definitely the realest one on the ballot when it came to the congressional candidates. But because my opponent was white and a former Miss America, the the money and the the uh established uh political folks they got behind her and so 
um, you know, we missed the opportunity to elect somebody, you know, that was more so for the people. Now she still ended up losing regardless, but it was like, you know, just another way to show how, when you really have people organized because money wins elections for the most part, but that's not a hard and fast rule. And so we even saw that in Talladega with our municipal election because the mayor that ended the person that ended up winning mayor, he had the least money. Um, he was running against a former incumbent, he uh who had signs everywhere, who had experience, he had everything going for him. But because we had gotten organized in the community and we had made so many contacts, we had knocked on so many doors and made so many phone calls, even though the overall turnout was low, the candidate that would have been our choice still got 57% of the vote, which was very high. That number is, is I mean, it, it still is, is uh, you know, amazing, that, you know, that he was able to garner that number. But it's an example that money doesn't have to win elections. It usually does just because it's easier that way. You know, you can buy the ad, the radio ads, the TV ads, the signs and buy the workers to do what you need to do, but it doesn't have to be. But um, unfortunately it is. And so we do talk to people about that and, and, and you know, who really is running our political systems and it is lobbyists, unfortunately, in the corporations. Mm -hmm. um, I want to combine maybe these two questions. So looking ahead to the elections for 2024, um, what are your plans for Transform Alabama and how do you aim to build on the momentum you've created? And could you provide some insights into your future projects including any upcoming tracks or campaigns that uh, Transform Alabama is working on. Should I break those up? That's good. Well, I'll start with, with upcoming. We'll start there first uh, because mm -hmm. I am on the Selma Jubilee board. Uh, for those people that don't know, um, Selma Jubilee is an annual commemoration of uh, Bloody Sunday, which was the catalyst for the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Um, that was the march that took place uh, going over the Edmund Pettus Bridge where um, the Alabama State Troopers beat over 600 um, foot soldiers, uh, protesters in Alabama. And uh, they tried a second time to, to march and they turned around. And then the third time was the actual march from Selma to Montgomery. And that all took place in March of 1965. So every year, the first weekend of March in Selma, Alabama, we commemorate um, what was done, but also it becomes a moment to recharge. Uh, Selma Jubilee is awesome because all like it doesn't matter what spectrum you are of politics. And when I say spectrum, I'm, I'm going with your lingo, Piper. <laughs> you don't say our spectrum within our circle. It don't matter. Everybody come into Selma. You know what I'm saying? And some people are going to be in their feelings because we let everybody in. But this is our time to recharge. And so for the last three years, we have done the uh, Intergenerational Hip Hop Political Summit. This year, uh, they've allowed me to co-coordinate the whole music festival, which takes place on um, March uh, the 2nd. Um, from 11 to 6 in Selma, March 2nd, 2024. Um, the whole uh, event, it's a four-day commemoration from February 29th up to March the 3rd. And so uh, that's what we have coming up. We're still working on our lineup for the music festival, but I would definitely encourage people, if you can come out, definitely come out. Um, you know, it, it really is, um, excuse me, a time to to recharge, to reconnect, to network with people um, and, and just hear and, and see things that you need to see for those of us that are, are really about um, doing the work in the community. So that's what uh, one of the things that we have coming up. Um, the other thing that we're really focused on, again, is getting the word out about this new congressional map. Um, when they redrew the map and made this new congressional district, 
it took parts of the district that I ran in, the third district. It took the two counties that I won in uh, 2020 and added them to the second district. But the thing about it, those two counties, Macon and Russell, have the absolute lowest turnout in the state. So while the second district being, uh, it's not even majority black, it's like 49% black. But even with that, if the people don't turn out, it means nothing at all. Like Supreme Court victory and, and all these uh, uh, milestones happening in other states, we won't see the impact if our people don't get out. So we're literally just um, working on our plans of um, getting this information, of just letting people know, especially in Russell and Macon County, now you have the opportunity to really feel like your vote counts when it comes to who's running for Congress. Because um, the thing about gerrymandering and what they have done uh, historically in Alabama is they group the Black people together to where our vote has the least impact or they break us up. You know what I'm saying? It'll be a cluster of Black people living somewhere, but they'll break us up to where our vote has less power. And so uh, a lot of the times people are making in Russell County, um, you know, they have felt like their vote doesn't matter, but now they have an opportunity to really see how it could, could matter. And so um, that that is what we're focused on um, for uh, for 2024. Um, I forgot the other question. Uh, it's basically like, you know, music projects that, you know, you're going to maybe put together, put out, yes. collaborate, any tracks. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So, um, you know, so so when it comes to like us creating um, DJ O, he and I, you know, once a year, we put our heads together for what the, cam the next campaign is going to be. So, um in 2022 it was race to the polls uh because in alabama we're like really big on car culture and here in talladega uh, we have the uh talladega 500 the nascar race and so we wanted to play up on that so we have race to the polls um in uh 2023 going into 2024 um the campaign that we're working on is deal me in uh, playing up on our spades and card culture here that we have in uh, in Alabama, and also amplifying the riverboat brawl. Now that that's a whole nother conversation, but what I will say is, um, when you dig deep, and I actually wrote an article for Upscale Magazine um, that's on the website uh, right after the the brawl happened, showing the connections to where. Um, it really is tied into Alabama's 150 year voting rights history. I know it was a broad that we saw and, 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 and it, we still, people still get inspired by all that, but the date that it happened, the parties involved, where it happened, so much of that is tied to Alabama's voting rights history. And so um, using that, as a tool of organization and tying that into our deal me in campaign. So uh, that's what we're pushing this year. And then finally, um, as I mentioned, me and all come together to, to think of like what the next song is going to be. So we have the song pick, we have the track, but I cannot disclose what it is just yet, but stay tuned because it will be released before Christmas. So we do have a new song that's going to come out and uh and one thing that that uh was put in my spirit by a mentor of mine last year is the idea of working with other alabama artists to come up with a like alabama song because um, there's a lot of signed artists from alabama and so he connected us with the artist um who goes by the name of Thule out of Huntsville. And Thule and I, uh, we just did our first event together, a turkey giveaway in Huntsville on the 19th of this month. And so uh, I'm hoping that that we can, you know, work together on, on bringing that to fruition because I thought it was a great idea and could be a great way to, uh, to organize people around the music. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> that's a lot of work it is it mm -hmm. is it is yes so okay but before you go you gotta rap for us or do something you could do something you already have or i don't know 
<laughs> oh goodness like we will wait to the end okay um okay okay um okay so we so um there's a, a civic engagement table that i'm a part of um called alabama forward and they have been a blessing like if it wasn't for for alabama forward i don't even know where transform alabama would be they are um our biggest funder but um the beauty of alabama forward is that they also too are hip-hop based they uh it's a civic engagement table for the whole state but the organization itself is hip-hop based and so um they came out with a rap album um, in 2021 and decided to do a remix album in 2023 and invited me to um to do a feature on one of the songs so uh we just uh released the song needles and so um let me give me a second to uh to thank okay we the change we've been waiting for won't be ignored they told us to chill we kicked in the front door warriors to the core yeah there's more in store angels all around cm444 it's time to read up learn more 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 while we stand in position watch the blessings pour so that's let me it. ask no that's cool <laughs> you know what yeah. every every show i've been asking people to do it and and I like people like oh no <laughs> right so, I, I should have expected it but yeah that that is uh <laughs> from needles y'all can uh it's on all streaming platforms and it's called um uh the caregivers road trip is the name of the album and the group is called shake the field and so it's the remix album that just came out this month and the song i'm featured on is called needles and again you know, so it's it's Transform Alabama is doing this work, but we are not alone in Alabama. And so, um, you know, there's there's a lot of us that are are looking to hip hop as a, as a tool to to help get our people engaged into the political system. So, y'all check and it so, out. And um, so, yeah. And before people go, I just want to uh, I'm gonna add this onto the um, the show notes. I just want to make sure that people, uh, you know, well, I'll add it. I'll make sure to add it into the, uh, the show notes Perfect. there. Yeah. So, um, and also to, uh, give us your, you know, all your socials and all the ways in which people can connect with you. And if you're going to have any events that are coming up soon, like what are all the ways in which people can engage, you know, with you again? Yeah, so um, Transform Alabama, you can follow us on Instagram at Transform Alabama. We're also on Facebook um, at Transform Alabama. Um, and we have a Twitter um, or X that we're not really using right now, but um, but you can follow us there as well. Um, you can also follow me. I'm at Dr. Dia on everything, um, mm -hmm. TikTok, Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter. Um, you could follow us, go to our website, uh, transformalabama.org. There you can see where we just released our merch. It's this little hat I got on. Um, okay. And you can make donations there. Giving Tuesday is tomorrow. We would love to get the donations because we do have a lot of work. But uh, we have teams that we are putting together. And y'all, when I tell you, we have made over 20,000 phone calls um, in the last, like, four months knocked on over a thousand doors like you know we got teams out here doing it but it, you know we need support to keep going so y'all can find all that information at transformalabama.org you can also sign up to get our newsletter that comes out we put something out at least once a month and then uh, to learn more about hype you can go to letsgethype.com i will be doing another training i do trainings uh, for certified hype facilitators at least once a year and I'm really feeling like 2024 is going to be the year that we bring back the in-person training. People have been asking. We we were already doing virtual like for the last like 12 years, but I will also do in-person as well. But um, we haven't done it since the beginning of 2020, kind of for obvious reasons. But uh, I am looking to bring that back in 2024. So if you're interested in uh, learning more about the hip hop therapy work that I do, um, check out let'sgethype.com and you can sign up to get more information 
um, you know, on that and, and make sure that you get the information when we decide on the date of when that next training is going to be. So this was dope server. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I gotta tell y'all, minister server, and and I gotta say it because this, you know, it's just I have to. Um, he is the one that introduced me to the hip hop declaration of peace, and so that's another thing that pretty much anytime I go somewhere and speak, I have to lift up that document. So we're gonna take this moment to do that. If you don't know what the hip hop declaration of peace is please google it. it it was a document that was presented to the united nations on may 16 2001 and it gives us principles to live by those of us that are within the culture and even those who are not in the culture but use it for various reasons these are standards that we need to live by and and i and i see that more so now than ever so server is the one that they introduced me to that document in 2010 and I talk about it on, on a regular basis to this day. So thank you, server. Yeah, that's a dope document. When I had my space, we had it up on the, uh, on, on our wall, uh, when I, you know, working with young people and we will always work off that with the young people. So it is a pretty mm -hmm. dope document. Plus it's a good way to like make, you know, different connections. It does need yeah. to probably get updated though. Cause, um, some of the, cause there's a lot of new artists since that time. Mm -hmm. to add on to it but um so shout so i want to shout you out i want to shout out everyone that's been in here with us i'll go backwards and say yes minister server has been with us uh jaman zenzabel kalanji stopped through uh yipper 99 leah boggs breaking ground big teal quaker anarchist you don't like my music um who else I love it. Look, I see snacks. I, I I stay on Black Power Media watching the show, so I hear some familiar names that I see from the chat. So I'm glad y'all came through. Yeah. This was dope, man. This was cool. Yeah. So I want to say peace to everyone that joined us, and for those who didn't um, get a chance to join, you know, us during the live. You know, you can watch the recording, but just asking you all to share, you know, like and subscribe. You know, um. On this show, the goal is to, at least for me, is to have us have these discussions and move the left more left and debate like within the left. Um, and I, I would say even just think about ideas that are different than our own and try to um, figure out how we can, you know, even just think about the things that we're thinking about, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. process a lot of this stuff together. There's a lot of conversations in hip hop right now. We're not having that conversation <laughs> here in this moment. That's going to be a whole nother few a shows nother. that I'm working on. Yeah. I want, you know, another purpose of this particular show, this platform that I'm doing here with women in hip hop is to also bring forth from women who identify as hip hop culture, um, what are the things that we want to talk about? What are the things that we want to highlight? Not just, you know, um, around like, you know, why don't you write songs like this? Or why don't you do these things? It's like, there's a lot of people that are doing a lot of great stuff. And so how do we, you know, bring more of that to the forefront and then also analyze it, critique it, but, you know, bring it to the forefront so that we're highlighting ourselves more so that we're the ones that are bringing forth the conversations that we want to have as women in hip hop, or at least women who identify as hip hop, so that um, these stories and narratives are not always like fed to us and the conversations aren't given to us. Like y'all need to be having these conversations. It's like, well, these are the conversations we want to have, right? So I just appreciate you and joining me on the platform, sharing about your work, being open to having conversation about the critiques of your work or your approach and and also bringing forth solutions for our community like that's really powerful you know what i mean like the work mm -hmm. i think the work that you're doing is very necessary um i I'm, i told you i'm gonna be in um montgomery yes in like, like in like maybe like two weeks so i'm gonna i'm gonna be yeah, on I'm retreat like but i'm gonna have to find you and at least buy you some tea or coffee or something. Yes. Um, yes. 
Yeah, and and just want to stay connected, and I'll have to come out there for your um, hip hop summit. We yeah, now that's that's what we got to talk about. Like we would mm -hmm. love to have you, so I'll um I'll send you some information, but just to give you your flowers as well. You know what I really one of the things I love about about your show and what you're doing is it gives women in hip hop the opportunity to just talk about issues versus us talking about being a woman in hip hop. You know what I'm saying? Like a lot of times when we're invited or when I'm invited or other women who I admire who you featured like when they're going someplace it's like people don't allow them to just talk about that thing that they do you know what i mean it's like they just got to talk about being a woman doing the thing that they do and not once did we talk about that which kind of might sound <laughs> kind of like you know what i'm saying but i mean it's just like it's just like you know being black you know what i'm saying if you're always asked to be on the diversity panel and talk about what is it like being black versus you just talking about what you do like why do i have to talk about that you know what i'm saying so I really, um, I really love that. And, and I love that, um, that you are giving women space to talk about this work that we do for the sake of talking about the good work that we do. You know, it, it happens to be that we're women and that's dope too. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, the fact that, that, you know, I can just talk about this, this work and, and share it. And, and then also, like you said, having that discourse, like, you know, I, I love hearing the other side because that does challenge me. Like those, that other side perspective, when you sent that, I was like, that's real. Like I can see <laughs> that, like they're not wrong at all. Like let's, let's talk about that more and get ahead of it or at least prepare for it. And I think that that's a lot of what's lacking that folks are, are so used to just digging their heels in and being right versus us having dialogue and discourse. So keep doing what you're doing and, and we definitely would love to have you come to Selma. We, we got to make that happen. Okay. Let's make it happen. Maybe, nah. I mean, maybe we do some black power media there, you know, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. For, yes, the, yes. for the South. I, I, my family um, is my, my family. We have our um, land there. My five oh. times uh, great grandfather purchased the land when he purchased his freedom and um, is 1897, I may have the year wrong, but ever since then, um, he purchased 2,500 square acres. What? So we own all of that. So we own the town that built the land, built the church, built the cemetery, built the school, built the whole thing. And it's this black enclave, I guess, surrounded by like clan territory <laughs> so you gotta wow. go wow but it, but we still own all of it and my mom passed away uh rest in peace and so i inherited Ooh. uh my four acres but my whole family like we're all related i know but uh we're all, yeah. <laughs> we're all that's we're very all related. much alabama that 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 story and i'm just gonna throw this out there there is they're still accepting applications for the black farmers lawsuit so i don't know what your other family members are doing but if it's i would encourage if somebody um you know in in the family may be interested it is a long application process mm -hmm. but um there's some people that are helping uh black people in alabama tap into that that money for the black farmers lawsuit so a lot of families in alabama with large plots of land um, are, are doing these applications. So that's an empowering no, that's, story. I mean, I got a, some video when I went, my great uncle, um, I got his, yeah, heirs property. My, my great uncle, mm -hmm. I got some video of him telling me how white folks were sharecropping on our land. Wow. And I was like, wow, we never hear those stories because yep. they, they were always, they were telling me that, you know, they've owned, so my family has owned everything all this time. Mm -hmm. And so um, they're very, you know, everything's self-sufficient. Like he told me how they, you know, use that stick to like find the water and dug mm -hmm. all the wells and we mm -hmm. walked all around, built all the houses. So wow. it's just interesting to me. Um, I, 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 like I said, I own the property. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna keep it a thousand, even though I'm from the hood. 
I'm scared of rattlesnakes. And we got rattlesnakes down there in the uh, yeah. yeah. We got rattlesnakes for the pond. So we have like a, a oh, pond sorry. and it's rattlesnakes there. And I'm like, ooh, because my grandmother always like, you know, spooked me about these rattlesnakes. And so yeah. I'm like, oh my lord. We got coyotes and uh fox and all type of stuff. But wow. the, they have chickens, they you know, do all their food. So um, if I can get my so we have people to help us with the property so I can call one of my cousins. Listen, like, call them and they might already apply for the lawsuit. I'm telling you, it's like Well, the thing is, we own everything. Right, but see it's Outright. like the USDA um it's I'll, I'll send you information on it. You they may want to apply. It's like a lot mm. of money because you know the USDA through the years has discriminated against black people who farm. And I'm mm. sure that your family having that land like that, mm -hmm. they got discriminated against. And so now the uh, U.S. government is like, you know, going backtracking. And so, I mean, I've heard of applications of people. I mean, in, any kind of way, like where they, they discriminate against, like not doing the loans for the seeds or the equipment, mm. you know, the things mm -hmm. that farmers do that the white farmers get that mm. the black farmers don't get. And just hearing the power that your family has, I'm sure like it, that that's one of the, I mean, cause I'm hearing like all kind of cases of other people, but that one that you're saying would be like, shoot, like y'all probably could tap in. I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm just like, I'm just, Hey, I'm gonna, uh, it's, it's, it's slightly problematic too, because, uh, they're Republicans. <laughs> that's all right. Look. That's to keep it a thousand. Hey, <laughs> Look, all, all of them were Republicans. And once our black people in Alabama, all of we was all Republicans at one point. Like a lot well, of that's them. why they are Republicans. Exactly. So if you if you yeah. talk to them to this day, they'll say we were always Republican. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of mm -hmm. like I'm like eh. that's not but, uncommon you know. in Alabama, believe it or not. There. Oh, okay. You know, yeah. Saying, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Okay, so. Man, you got your work cut out for you, don't you? Sure do. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> real out here. Come save us, Piper. Help us out. Help us out. <laughs> so you know what? We need we need to send you all the love now that we know that you're down there with. <laughs> you know it. Look, you your see the third good marshals. <laughs> yes, you see what we up against, man. You see it. You see wow. it. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So it just that's why I said, like when we when we really get right. And run our own slate of candidates. Like I said, like even the opposition, like points are made. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like I can some things, you know, I'm not even going to argue against. But, you know, where does that leave us as a people? And how can we use what we have to get the, the best that we can out of, you know, what uh, out of what we have? And then just even you saying that, you know, why don't we hear those stories and mm -hmm. know what our people have done? Because they don't want us to know because we got all the power we need. But it's about us knowing who we are and tapping into it. And so that's why I get real selfish about what we're doing in Alabama. Like, yeah, it's dope what we're doing, but we want to keep it here and really empower the people here because there are great resources and, and great things that we have, but we really got to tap into it. So, you know, I'm hoping that we can bring you here and, and you know, and, and do some more some more work together. And of course, VPM and um again got to shout out Kalanji. Like shout I saw him Kalanji. like man, that article, bro. Like those those uh articles from 1965 that he sent me, that mm. that changed my world. That that literally changed wow. my world and sparked the starting Transform Alabama and even naming it Transform Alabama. Cause we're like, how did we not know the Black Panther Party started in Alabama? Like, how did that get lost in the in the storytelling? So we yeah. said we're never gonna let what we're doing with hip hop get lost. We're gonna know it was in Alabama. So so that okay. is what we named. We named it Transform Alabama. That's yep. beautiful. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Well, travel safely. It's, it's, you might be home, but you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah. And so um, I want to just thank everybody who joined us today and all the listeners, and just sending you lots of encouragement. And um, all the work that you're doing, you know, just continue to protect it, protect all your people yes. and just sending you all so much strength and power, you know, and thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. So, um, you. all right, y'all. Well, this is uh, 
Dr. Dia, y'all want to check her out, go check her out on all of her socials. Yes. And also remember to like, share, subscribe this video. Um, let people know. Let people know about the work that she's doing. Let people know about this channel. Let people know about this show on Mondays at 8 here on Black Power Media's YouTube. And um, y'all be blessed and have a wonderful week. And I'm going to see y'all next week. Peace.